Okay. Okay. So good evening, everybody. Uh, today, this part of the of the class would be a sort of a a crash course uh, into web technologies. So maybe some of you already have some uh, knowledge, some idea about uh, uh, how uh, the what we call the the World Wide Web uh, works, uh, or what kind of uh, network uh, protocols. Uh, uh, it works, and uh, what kind of uh, architectures it's built upon. Huh? But for who's not uh, so familiar, or, uh, or 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 also to to have the the chance of clarifying the general picture and then go into more detail about what we need uh, uh, in this course, uh, I I start uh, from an overview. So the idea is uh, when we are talking about when you are using web technologies so every time you open a browser but also every time you open a mobile application and we will see in many cases uh, also when you are using some embedded systems they use uh, a set of technologies that have been developed uh, for, for the World Wide Web so actually we are trying to have a look uh, at uh, very slightly uh, about how the web supports uh, interactive user interfaces, but mainly later uh, how the web will be used to integrate distributed applications, to put together different pieces of software uh, running on different hardware, some on the user interface, some on the gateway, some on the devices, and so on. So it's a, a sort of integration technology which is very, uh, very powerful and very easy to use uh, today. And in particular, uh, um, after the general uh, overview, we give more details about the HTTP protocol because we need to understand in more detail what are the options and the different fields. Uh, and uh, one way, one pattern, one architectural pattern, uh, to use the HTTP protocol to uh, manage uh, remote services and remote resources, actually. Mm -hmm. So these are the the main uh, uh, points. Hmm? Probably the, the last point will be, we will start uh, probably today, but we continue next week uh, when we try to apply also this pattern REST to uh, also the dog gateway that we'll see in more detail. So I, I decided to, to start uh, from a, a sort of historical point of view. Uh, if you look uh, at the web technologies today and you you wake up uh, today uh, and see what's there, uh, it's very difficult to understand why there are so many languages, so many standards, so many strange ways uh, of doing something. And uh, uh, if you look at the, at the end result on, on how we build web uh, systems today. And to understand uh, some some of the technologies we have today, we need to go back in time and to understand how these were built and why, uh, what were the, the design choices at the time uh, in which they were built. Hmm? Um, so we, we try to go back in time and start from simple web architectures and go more and more complex towards what we have today. Hmm? Um, I, I won't make it long, but just to point out how the different uh, technologies and architecture just built uh, on top of each other. And so today we have actually a, a big set of them. Uh, first of all, when we are tr uh, talking about uh, the architecture that powers the World Wide Web, we have a very high stack of levels, different levels, huh? in which we have uh, one, usually you open a browser and go to some web application, and so the two let's say, things that we know and we see better are the browser itself and the application. Some software, might be Facebook, maybe Google, uh, maybe the Polytechnic or server, uh, that runs an application that you can use uh, through your browser. This is what we feel, what we see, hmm? usually. We use the browser to access some application. Uh, this application can be reached, so we can reach the application thanks to uh, the internet infrastructure, so we, we must have connectivity first, uh, 
And then this connectivity should lead us to some uh, web server, which is a combination of a hardware and software, uh, to run the communication between the browser and the application itself. Uh, the strength of the web is that they have standardized the way in which a user level application, a browser, can communicate to a server level application. And this is done through the HTTP protocol and the web server itself, which is the software that on the server side manages the HTTP protocol. That can allow us to hide most of the infrastructure from the application point of view. The application itself then can, let's say, uh, create interface and uh, serve the users uh, by using uh, external that are maybe data stored into databases or other services, other web services outside uh, its network. So we'll try to build this picture one piece at a time. Uh, what we have in mind, uh, and we will use it for the example, is the, the original picture, in which we have uh, one or more web servers that have some content, and you are a client on your computer with your browser, you connect to the server across the internet. Okay, so let's uh, be very clear. Uh, we use here the term internet just to describe the network. Okay? Uh, the applications that run, we call them the web applications. So the internet layer is a connectivity layer, the web layer is the applications that you can build on top of the internet. Hmm? Uh, we use this picture using the client, uh, and so basically it was a browser in which interactively you can navigate to information. Sorry? Si? Qual è? No. L'ultimo. Era l'ultimo. L'ultimo di qua. <laughs> ok, va meglio? Okay. Um, so, historically, the web was designed with a browser in mind, so a, a software on the client's machine. But actually today we have mobile applications also that can interact with information with the servers. We can have desktop programs which are not, pro, um, um, sorry, which are not browsers, but also can use the same infrastructure or other servers that can play the role of a client toward a different server. So this is just uh, different machines that are, that are able to exchange information through the web technologies, that is, a set of technologies that were developed for building the World Wide Web navigated by, interactively by a user. Okay? Um, so let's... Uh, not go into all, all the details. You have, as usual, I have a larger set of slides, so that if you, if you want to read more, I'm skipping something that you can read. Um, when I'm talking about a server, so a web server, an application server, a database server, um, I'm using this term, it may be used in, a different, uh, in different ways. I can talk uh, about a physical server, so a computer, a physical computer that I call, ah, I built a server, uh, I bought, so I bought a server with, uh, I spent 10,000 euros uh, to buy a very powerful server. This is the machine, the hardware. Actually, the view that we have here in, in describing the architecture is more of a logical view. A server is a software component that runs on some machine, on some hardware, and delivers some functionality. And the type of server depends on the type of functionality that we want to give. Uh, the mapping between logical servers and physical servers or machines can be different. If we have a, an application which is, not, which is not very demanding from the point of view of computational power, we can have different servers all on the same machine, all on the same computer. If we are building a very big service with uh, thousands of requests of, of users per second that 
connect to the system, then probably each logical server must be split across, for scalability, across many physical machines, like, like in cloud computing and so on, when you have a lot of ha hardware for, for implementing a given la a logical layer of the architecture. So the mapping between logical and physical servers is not one-to-one, -one, maybe one-to-many or many-to-one. Hmm? Uh, and so this uh, is valid in general for each of these layers. Let's start from the most important central layer here, the web server. What happens, what, what is it, uh, and uh, how it works, okay? By definition, a web server is a software able to manage the HTTP protocol. And the HTTP protocol is a very simple protocol. It's an application level protocol in terms of network, uh, of computer networks. Uh, and it may handle, and it's very simple because it handles a simple request response interaction pattern. So each uh, interaction in the HTTP protocol is a request being sent from the client to the server and the response that the server gives back to the client. Always pairs of messages. One is a request and the other is a response. And basically what the web server does is the software which is, a, is, is open to receiving requests from all over the world. So I put a software onto a machine and this software is as a web server is able to accept HTTP request from any client. Once I receive a request, I execute this request and that could mean either reading a static content, a page, an image from a file, or activating, running a function, a procedure, some code uh, to, to be executed when this request arrives. In both cases, what we want to build is a response, a file, to send back to the original client who sent us the request. This is the whole life of a web server. A web server receives a request. This request can be static or dynamic. So for a static content, something that is already on disk, or dynamic, something that must be computed, and so I must run or activate a piece of software to compute what I mean, what I need. In this case, a file with the result, and I send that file back to the client. And then I begin again with another request from the same client or from a different client, I don't care. Okay? Um, so every request is a different HTTP connection, and on, each, and on every HTTP connection, I have only one exchange of messages. Actually, the client uh, wants to go, when you type uh, an address or click to a, onto a link on your browser, what happens is that your browser creates one packet, one network packet, in the form of, the, of an HTTP request, and sends this request to the web server. This software receives the web server software, logical layer, that runs somewhere, of course, on some hardware, receives this request, and if it's a static request, maybe it's a request for an HTML file, which is already on, on disk. And so the, the job of the web server is just to send this file back to the browser through another message, which is called, which is formatted as an HTTP response. And the goal of the browser is to display the page. Uh, if we are talking about simple HTML pages, of course. And even this simple scenario involves a lot of different uh, technologies and standards. So I'm presenting bit by bit the different standards that were evolved uh, during the years. So this dates back to 50 years ago. The first web server was more or less 50. 25, sorry, 25 years ago. And uh, the, the minimum technology that you needed is uh, a way to find and to give a name to web pages. 
So if I want to see the home page of a given company of, or a given person, I need to today we are coming to that. I need the, to know the address of that page, or I need to have a search engine that gives that will give me a link to that address. So every resource on the web has a unique identifier, which is called URL, Uniform Resource Locator. And URLs are just uh, strings like this. Uh, there is a standard that describes how they are built. And they are composed of three different main parts. The first is the protocol. The second is the host machine. And the third is the content inside the host machine. The protocol, if you are talking about web technologies, is in most of the cases the HTTP protocol that describes how the browser and the server will speak. An alternative may be the FTP protocol, for example, for exchanging files through FTP and not through HTTP. Then is the, is the machine to be contacted through the Internet. So if I'm, this client must contact one server, okay, there are millions of servers over the Internet, which one needs to be contacted? This is given by the first part of the address, between the double slash and the first slash. The rest is a, a parameter that describes the content that we want inside that specific server. Hmm? The last part here is uh, interpreted by the network software in your machine that converts the name uh, through an address and uh, through the TCP IP protocol opens a, a, so a socket to that address, for example. The second part is interpreted at the server side. The server receives this request and says, okay, I have a thousand pages on my, on my site. Which, what page, which page does the user want? Okay, this one. And does with some internal rules to get the file that the user wants. So this is the, uh, the general idea of giving one string in this format protocol. Um, semicolon slash slash hostname slash local path one string of this type for every possible resource we could imagine on the web they may be web pages they may be image, images they may be services that, as we will learn later hmm? more modernly they may be ser services and okay there are different variations about the schemes you can have some parameters, the syntax for URL, URI is, is not complex, but uh, it, it has different pieces. You can specify some parameters with a question mark uh, and uh, a, a set of uh, name value pairs, name user value one, name action value contact. And so the, the syntax with a question mark that starts the list of parameters and the ampersand that separates one parameter for the, from the, to the other. You can give some basic authentication information. You can give the, the port in which uh, you want uh, the uh, TCP port in which you want to open the connection and so on. You can specify the HTTPS, which is a different protocol that runs encrypted instead of the HTTP, which just runs uh, in clear and plain text and so on. But then this is the address for knowing uh, where a uh, given resource is. And then you need uh, to create, to understand the protocol by which uh, this request is sent and the reply is uh, retrieved. And actually, HTTP is a terribly simple protocol. Huh? It's just a, some, when you click on a link, what your browser does is, is as I said, to, is to create a, a HTTP request, which is just a very small text file, text fragment. Actually, the first line is important. Get the, the file we want, uh, HTTP. And this text fragment is being sent over the internet to the server. It's a comment, it's a request. Dear server, please, I want this. Plus some other information that the browser 
wants to specify to the server for better executing the request, if the server cares about that. For example, the browser re responds that it's able to interpret and accept different type of file formats than the server can send back. Hmm? So if the server has the same information in different formats, it can negotiate the content to, a, to, a, to an extent. And uh, uh, server response is not much more complicated. It's also the server, the HTTP response given from the server to the browser in the opposite direction is basically one line again with HTTP, a code, confirmation code, some information, then a blank line, an empty line, and the document itself, the file that we wanted. It may be text, it may be binary, and so on. So it's basically one line in which I request what I want, and uh, one line that says, okay, I have it, uh, instead of giving an error, and here it is, a blank line, and here it is, the content. It's very simple, okay? We will learn later more, more details about this, but this is what uh, runs the, the web. If you take, for example, this page, and I click to load this page, what happens is that this take, is taking some time, what happens here, it is just a simple inspector that is built inside uh, Firefox, for example. It tells me about all the requests uh, that have been made. Let's focus on the first one. Get slash. What is the slash? It means the main page, the root page of the website uh, of this address. And... Uh, The request was get to this page. And you see the request headers are, uh, is, contains all the other information that this browser has sent to the server. Everything is here. The host name I want, so here, uh, let's close this one. Just to be clear. The, resp the request is here. The browser tells, okay, I introduce myself, which kind of browser I am, what kind of uh, file types I am able to accept, what kind of language I will accept, whether I can accept compressed uh, responses or not, and something like that. But basically very few information on top of the real information, which is what page I want to get. And then the server sends back uh, the response, it called uh, OK, so it was found, and uh, with some uh, additional header, additional information, for example, uh, the date in which uh, uh, this response was given back, uh, the type uh, that was compressed with, G with gzip, it was, uh, this is the name of the server, software, and so on. Hmm? Uh, keep alive, five, 15 means that, uh, okay, after 15 seconds, probably the page should change, so you should reload it and some information like that. And then the file, the file itself, hmm? which is an HTML file. We don't care about HTML, so how to describe the pages here in this course. Hmm? Um, so actually, when, uh, whenever you click on a link, uh, this is what happens. If you click here, to the ambient intelligence, for every click, uh, in this case, it's a different uh, request, uh, get uh, of this longer address, because it's an internal page, but then the, the handshake of information is the same. The browser sends a request header, a request, and uh, se uh, the server sends back a response, which is made of some header lines, uh, and then the content of the page that I requested. And the content actually is written in the HTML language. So this is the HTML code corresponding to this page that we just loaded. 
Okay, if you want to build a web application, of course, you must learn HTML because you must learn how to create nice pages with the, with the real content. Hmm? HTML is just one format that has been transported on top of the HTTP protocol. So when they talk about HTTP protocol, this protocol word seems a very complex thing. It's just the specification on how to write these simple headers in, in text, in plain text, that are, that are being sent uh, uh, forward and backwards from the client to the browser. Uh, all of this, uh, of course, takes some time. So if, if we want to uh, reason about the performance of these operations, uh, we have two different measures. One is the latency. Uh, we are transforming, requesting some remote information, okay? So the, um, there is a minimum time that we have to wait between the time in which we send out the request and the time in which we start receiving the response. This is called the latency. The time in which we just have to wait, we hope everything goes fine, and uh, until we get uh, the beginning of the response back. I wrote here the, the, time, the time requiring from providing uh, and a, a response uh, of zero bytes, just to get, get back the information that, okay, this is the response, it was one byte, zero bytes. The time it is needed uh, is called the latency. Huh? Uh, it, what, it depends basically on the speed of the internet connections, the latency of the internet connection between the client and the server, and between the server and the client, because it, the message has to travel both ways and uh, the load on the server. How much the server is powerful and is loaded and at this moment, so how fast it can process your request. Hmm? So it can be computed, the, the late, latency is a time, so it should be expressed in the number of seconds minimum for a given HTTP request. Usually it's easier to give the, the inverse number. So the, the maximum number of HTTP requests that you can give per, in one second. For, so for example, if you have your one latency of 50 milliseconds, you will have uh, uh, 200 requests per second maximum. Okay, it's uh, 1,000 over 50. Uh, in the browser, you can see This information, timings, and you say that uh, it took 384 milliseconds. Uh, so this is the, the time needed for, for this uh, response. Um, this uh, is a measure that is useful for small content. If I want to, to download small files, zero byte files, uh, the time needed is dominated by the travel time of the messages and uh, the response speed uh, of the server. But if we have to download uh, heavy information, images, files, when we download something, then uh, you must also take into account the time that the, the file, the page, the response takes uh, to travel to the browser. And so this is called the throughput the maximum speed at which one page can travel to the browser. And I said here, a page of virtually big size, infinite size. How many bytes per second I am able to receive? And this is actually dominated by the bandwidth, by the smaller bandwidth that we find on the path from the server to the browser. So actually, the, the real time if we have uh, one uh, zero byte page to download, uh, the time is need needed is just the latency time. If we have uh, one very large uh, page, uh, the time is dominated by the throughput that the, the internet connection can achieve. In the intermediate case, uh, well, the response time is a sort of a, of a sum of the latency, which is the minimum for starting to receive the first bit of the response, plus a time which is proportional to the size of the response. 
divided by the throughput. So if the throughput is higher, if I have a 20 megabits per second instead of 10, then the time for transferring the file would be half because the throughput is twice. But uh, the latency is an independent measure that can be longer or, or smaller. Hmm? Uh, so just try to, also to, to keep in mind what are, what are our bottlenecks. Huh? If we want to give a feedback to the user, you should be always be under some, hundred, under some hundreds of milliseconds. Okay, this is just a, a picture of how the user clicks, uh, the browser prepare, prepares the request, sends it to the server, the server analyzes the request, reads the file, creates the response, sends the response back to the browser, and the browser receives and visualizes the response. At this point, uh, the, the, um, the work of the server is finished, and uh, the user has the response in front of his eyes, and we are the so-called user think time. The time between the user sees a page, a response, and, uh, be and before the user clicks on somewhere else on that page. Then we start another HTTP request. Okay? Um, so this is a, a, a picture that tries to uh, summarize and we'll try to add pieces to this picture. Uh, what, we, what are the components that we saw up to now? We have the browser with the user that we're using the mouse on the keyboard send, decides that he wants to read an URL. This URL composes a request that is sent to the web server, and the web server reads this file and can send it back to the browser that has the goal of displaying it to the user. Um, this is uh, just a statistic about, uh, I call it web server. Web server is a software. Actually, 60 plus 15 it's uh, more than 80 percent, uh, nearly 80 percent of the all the web server in the in the world are just running two different types of software. The blue one is the Apache free open source uh, implementation, and uh, the red one is the Microsoft uh, server for sites that are using the .NET technology. Hmm? Yeah, this is updated to 2014. There is some increase here in the Google servers for people that are running uh, websites hosted on the Google platform, which is using their own uh, server. Plus one, uh, you see this green line, which is increasing. It's not very clearly written here, uh, visible here, is this Nginx, uh, which is a new generation engine for it. It's a, it's a faster and simpler and a smaller web server, which is also an open source project, uh, uh, which is faster and smaller than Apache. Apache is very powerful, but it can be quite big to manage. Hmm? So some sites where, where the load is very high, they are trying to have very more, more efficient servers, which is more, uh, more or less, they are all around 15%. Uh, a web server is a very, uh, how can, 60% of the websites of the world all run the same software. All the websites are all different. Okay? There are no two websites that are, that are equal to each other. But they are all running the same software. Why? Well, because this software just, just, uh, it's not so easy, but just manage the HTTP protocol. Just may, enables me to exchange messages between the browser and the, and the server. And if, uh, uh, what, what makes the experience of the user, the content of the website, is not the web server, it's the content that the web server can access. Actually, the web server is only able, by itself, a web server, is only able to give you some file which is already existing. Well, we don't want this. We don't want to read, the, if we use a website, Gmail, for reading the email, the, our, our messages, we don't want to read the one message that was already written, that was already on, on file. I want to read the message that just arrived. I want to 
have information that updates all time, at all times. So actually, what we need is not just uh, the capability of using the HTTP protocol to transfer files, but also to transfer information that is computed in real time. If I want to check the temperature of this house and I have a web server that gives me that information, I want the temperature now. So when I do the request, I want that sensor to be read, to be queried, and to give me that information now. And this is something that a web server software cannot do because it doesn't know what are your specific requirements. So what the web servers do, actually, all the web servers, gives you a way of integrating with the web server component, which is a standard software, your own specific code. We call it an application. You write some code, which is called by the web server when a request arrives. So when a request arrives asking for the temperature, the web server recognizes that this request is uh, for an information which is dynamic, which is changing, which is not static. So the web server doesn't, will not find on disk uh, a file with the temperature. The web server will find on disk a software that you wrote that contain, contains the instructions for getting the temperature and then creating the response that contains this information. So most of the requests of the web servers today are just a request that needs to be redirected to some applications that contain some logic, some software, some algorithm to create one response, for example, one HTML page, which is created in this moment for this user, for this request, a specific request, and this is being sent back with a response. And this specific response is being forget, uh, forgotten immediately. If I make a, another request one second later, it will activate again the application that will compute again the result. When you refresh a page, for example, it compute a new result and send you a new page, a new result in the, in the response that you give. Huh? So, um, the web server is used to manage the connection. And then, when a request arrives, a given piece of logic, of software that you write, is being executed. That knows what to do in, your, in this specific case. Hmm? So this is where we are going to do development. All of this is standard. The internet is there, browsers are there, the web servers you just take one, you can you use Apache, you can use the Python libraries, HTTP libraries in Python. Uh, it's already there. What you need to write, what you need to be aware of is what to do when a request arrives. Okay, it depends on the request. And so for every type of request, for every address of the request, you will have to specify a different fragment of code. This uh, required historically to add some new technologies to give to the HTTP protocol the possibility not just of giving a request, get address, but also to give additional data in the request. For example, if I'm registering myself in a website and giving a request with all my data attached. So they invented a way to attach some structured data to an HTTP request. It's what we call the post data. We'll, for HTTP, we'll get in more detail later, okay? Uh, and some way for the web servers to integrate applications. So all of this was developed uh, through the years. What happens today is that when a request arrives to the web server, the web server is aware, knows that it, it is not able, it is not able to answer. It is a dynamic request. So instead of going to the disk, and reading the response, it passes the request, it handles the request to the application server, to your code. And here it's your code running, the application running time. 
the more efficient you are in writing the code, the faster the web server will respond. Because the web, ser web server here is waiting for the application to respond with the response to give back, again, to the client. Hmm? Uh, in most of the cases, how can the application know the response? If my application is, a, I don't know, a mail application, I'm building Gmail, how can the application code, the code I write, know how many messages I have in my inbox, for example? How can I know? How can my code know? Well, usually it's stored somewhere. It has to access to query some database in which we have all the information. It's not... Uh, not every web application needs a database, but most of them need some sort of place where to store information that will be used to the application logic to be updated, to be queried, to be displayed, and so on. So in many cases, uh, the application software, for creating the response, need to query a database or some sort of permanent storage. And the database gives back the data that the, uh, that the application logic uh, will uh, understand and, send, and use to, to construct the response. Hmm? Uh, in some cases, it's a database. In some other cases, maybe some external entity, so some external website that has the information, or some uh, sensor, some external device, and so on. Because the application logic usually has the algorithm but needs to have some data fed to it to, to be able to respond significantly, hmm? meaningfully. Uh, okay, so there, there are again some standards uh, that are being added. We, we don't care too much about this level of application database integration. Uh, cookies for storing the, the state of the session and uh, SQL, of course, for querying the database. By the way, we don't have the time here, but uh, it's, it would be a nice story to see how the philosophy of HTTP, which is a short-lived protocol, many short requests, requ requests in HTTP. Request response, forget. Request response, forget. And SQL, which is a very long-lived uh, protocol in which we open a connection that could last for every eight, here, eight hours, and then you do 1,000 queries in that connection, and then you close the connection. There are very two different philosophies, and integrating them together in an efficient way is very difficult. Hmm? Because they actually, they just, the internet is, the web was born like this. Starting from static pages, the developers started to want something more. They wanted uh, dynamic pages, they wanted uh, a permanent storage, they wanted external integration, and so on. At every step, developer just took what was available, what was available, the best, the best type of tools that were available. And so web technologies today are integrating 20 different technologies. And they're not part of a, a single, original, very clean plan. There are some parts in which are very creaking. Uh, they, they, they don't fit together very well. Because just historically, we, when a need arises, the developers find a solution that is good today, at that moment. And then usually that solution just is there to stay for the next 20 years. Hmm? Every time we, we start to think about better solutions, but what do you see that uh, in, in, the, in the web technologies there are really a lot of different Standard, a lot of different languages that are all mixed together. Hmm? Okay, uh, so what happens when you add a, a, a person, a person la la layer, a database layer, to your database, to your web application, is that the application server runs one or two or three or ten queries towards the database to get all the information. So, for example, you are Reading your mail, so the application first queries uh, whether the password is correct and then what is the number of messages of the inbox and then all the list uh, of message IDs and for each of these message IDs, the subject and the date and the size and so on. One 
generating one response may imply many queries to the database server. It's no surprise that from the hardware point of view, the main costs usually are here because it's the most computing intensive component. The sites that the Twitter, Facebook, and so on, which are handling a very large traffic, usually don't use relational SQL databases. They are using these new NoSQL approaches, which are very much faster because it was not sustainable. The other problem is the bandwidth of the internet, but it's not a web problem, it's a more of a, connection, a connectivity problem. So actually, the, every web application usually does something like this. This is in the PHP language, but don't care about the language. Uh, saying that when a page is, is called on a web application, some of your code is executed. And your code will do something like understand what is requested. For example, the query that was requested by the user and create uh, some SQL instruction to get the information you want, uh, starting from the user parameters, use some way of communicating with the database to get the result, and finally, getting the result uh, and constructing the, the response, the page. Hmm? More or less, this is the pattern in the, in the, in the, in the simplest case. So we added all of this. Uh, just a comment uh, I forgot before about the images. Um, as you saw, when we looked at the browser, when you request a page, this request uh, generates one main HTTP request plus many other GET requests. What happens? What happens is that uh, the first request uh, contains uh, an HTML file for the page. This HTML is just text. But the page also contains images, contains colors, contains uh, uh, decorations, and so on. All these images are integrated in the page uh, as separate requests. So the HTML says that at, at some point, uh, you need this image. And uh, the HTML code specifies which image I want, and the browser just, uh, for example, this one is a new email button. The print button is this one. You see these buttons there? These are small images that are being loaded in different uh, requests. One request, one response. The HTML file contains uh, 50 images Okay, so you, you will have 51 requests for that page. One for the HTML and 50 for each of the 50 images. Each of them will have a latency time to execute. And you see that uh, um, some of them can run in parallel. So the HTML is read. Once I get the HTML, I can understand what which images I need, and which additional files, JavaScript, style sheet, and so on, I need. And the browser starts requesting all of this. Some of them can run in parallel, some have to wait. And so then there's another batch running in parallel. Some are slower, some are longer, because maybe at that point the web server was a bit uh, uh, being banged by a lot of different requests at the same time, so it, it takes some time also the web server to respond, it's just a computer, it's not, uh, and so on. And at the end, uh, we see that some of these will also be slower. Hmm? So this is why we have this picture that says the request is for one HTML file, but then this request will trigger, will trigger many more requests uh, constantly concerning all the different additional files, for example, images. And then, for generating HTML, we say that we need to run an application and query a database, usually. We are not finished yet, because in, uh, up to this point, uh, we can only describe uh, very simple and static pages. 
during the years, uh, they had uh, other additions that we are not going to detail today uh, for creating pages that are uh, easier to lay out. So uh, creating columns, uh, creating colors, spacing, and so on, and uh, can handle some user interaction. Up to now, the only interaction that the browser offers to the user is clicking onto a link. The only thing that the user can do is click into a link. But we know that we can do more. Huh? We can interact with the page. We can have uh, small games also in the web pages. And this is due to the fact that inside the browser, they developed a language, which is called JavaScript, that can be used to run applications inside the, the browser. So your browser is not just something for sending and receiving HTTP requests, but it contains an interpreter, a virtual machine, for the JavaScript language. And these JavaScript files reside, are saved on the server, and are copied or sent over the internet, and your browser just executes them. And these JavaScript files can interact with the page, with the, with, with the elements on the web page that you just loaded. This is, uh, is essential if we are building, uh, say, modern web applications, but since we are using HTTP more for controlling devices and so on, uh, we will not spend time about these two technologies. Hmm? But it's just to show that the number, uh, it, you, you see the, the different uh, uh, circles that I put in this picture, each of them is a different language. And to create even a simple web application, you need to know all of this. Hmm? Maybe you are more specialized in some or in, the, in others, but all of these languages are needed for creating even simple web applications. And then, it came the dynamically changing web, the web 2.0, with the social network, social content, the video, multimedia, interaction, and so on. And this requested even higher interactivity of the user onto the web page. Um, just one example, one for all. Let's take Google, for example, that you all know. And you say that I'm searching for ambient intelligence. Okay, what happens here? What is this list of words? The autocompletion, you know. Of course, every site should have that. How might it work? It works that this is a one, one web page onto my computer. It contains some JavaScript code that is executed every time I press a letter. Every time I press a letter, some JavaScript code is executed in my browser, not on Google servers. And what this code does is to compute all the possible completions of the letters I wrote up to here. Okay? and then modifies the content of the page accordingly with the completion. So what happens is that here, we, I have some JavaScript running on the page. When I press a, a button, this JavaScript code knows what I write and modifies the page. This arrow means that the JavaScript engine can read and write the content of the page through the, this DOM, document object mode. But how can this small piece of JavaScript running this page know all the possible words in the universe? It can't. To get the, all, all the possible words in the universe, it must ask to his father, to Google. OK, the user wrote AMBI. What are, please Google, tell me what are the possible completions of AMBI. So what happens is that the browser, through the JavaScript, needs to contact the server many times while the user is using the same web page. So the server, if we see what happens on the network, if I write ambient here, A, 
M, B, sorry, A, M, B, I. And you see that uh, the requests are piling up. Every time you write something, my page is contacting Google saying, OK, give me the completion for this. So even inside the single page, data is exchanged between the browser and the server. And what data is exchanged? Let's have a look. The request is HTTP clients uh, complete slash complete search uh, blah 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 blah. At the end, uh, there should be some uh, somewhere the string ambient Q equal ambient nearly to the end here. I cannot move the mouse, otherwise the, <laughs> the, the tooltip will disappear. So it sends a request that contains what I'm typing in real time into that box. And the browser, very kindly, will give me a set of uh, completions. Ambient can be completed as uh, uh, ambient intelligence, sensitive, uh, ambient... Uh, Ambient, uh, where are the other? Ambient music, uh, ambient dosage, and so on. With other characters that they will uh, interpret in some way. Hmm? So, this uh, is not, we are using, and this is a point where, uh, where it starts uh, becoming interesting to us. We are using the same HTTP protocol, the same technology that we use, that has been used since 25 years just to interact with web pages, well, we are using this technology to enable a small software application, the JavaScript running in our web page, to interact with, an, with a web server, which is in this case the Google server, for exchanging some data, for computing, for requesting a service. A service that cannot be executed locally because we don't have the data. Google service has all the data about the frequency of completions. So this is the sort of revolution. The HTTP protocol was designed for interactive usage, but now it's used everywhere. Just because it's very easy to, de to deploy a web server, because there are a lot of very efficient open source ones, just because the protocol is so simple, it is so, doesn't demand too much to be deployed, then this HTTP protocol is being used everywhere. Not for, for navigating web pages, but for exchanging data. For exchanging data that one software application application needs to ask to another software application. And if they are on two different machines, how do they communicate HTTP? With some rules, of course. But uh, this is the, the, the main approach. So actually, if we are still in the, in the web, classical web uh, side, we, what we get is these interactive applications from which the, auto co the autocomplete is the, the smaller and the si more simple example in which we see that we have uh, the browser and so on that, get, that does their own request. But then the browser contains an application, the JavaScript code, and this application can do requests on its own and get the response on its own. The response, most likely, will not be a web page. It will be just some data formatted in some way. And there are actually two ways of formatting this data, which is using XML format or the JSON format. Which are two different text formats. Uh, we will give more details on the JSON uh, because it's more used uh, today. Because again, it's simpler. So we are reusing all the infrastructure where now the client is no longer the browser. It's no longer the user. The client is a software application. In this case, a JavaScript application running inside the browser. But it can be generalized in any way. We need a lot of uh, uh, additional technologies, in particular the possibility of uh, 
executing JavaScript and uh, for the JavaScript to execute HTTP requests uh, asynchronously. Asynchronous means uh, that this request uh, done by the JavaScript code will not uh, reload the page. It's not synchronous with page loading. With the what? Yeah. Come? Mm. Come? Okay. Prego. We need an intelligent system for uh, uh, for the lights in this room. Uh, I said this is asynchronous because it's not synchronous with page loading. The, the, the request goes and the, the response comes back without affecting the page. Hmm? And what happens is that uh, you see the uh, the browser loads the initial page. And then the JavaScript code in the page starts making a lot of requests on its own while the page is loaded and without the user explicitly requesting for a new page. So this is the, the torrent of new requests that uh, come out today. So the, if we want to complete this picture, I add this new Ajax technology, which is called asynchronous calls from JavaScript. That may happen directly from the JavaScript engine to the same web server, but the same web server will now request for data corresponding to some specific request. And this can be generalized. You see, I can have uh, one client connecting to a website running some application code. This application code uh, doesn't know, doesn't have the response information that it, it, it needs. It, so it needs to contact uh, over HTTP another web server to give you the information, to give you the response, the result. And so the web server can play as a web client to another server. So the client here made a request here to this web server. This application is, OK, I need to know, I don't know, the, the temperature in Torino. So I can call the web server for the site uh, Weather uh, ABC that gives me this information. And so. While the user is waiting there, I can call another web server with a specific query, if it's allowed, of course, and then the web server will return me back the data that I need to complete the request for the original user. So HTTP is used between the client, the browser, and the server, of course, but also between a server and an, another server for requesting services. Okay, Of course, I don't need HTML here. I don't want HTML. I don't need the user interface. I don't need anything. Just data exchange. But data exchange using an infrastructure which is already there, which is the web infrastructure. Internet, web servers. HTTP, URI. The four ingredients that are running the integration of applications today. HTTP is very good because it, every proxy is able, is able to, every um, firewall it will always let you HTTP pass and not block it. Any other protocol would probably have more trouble to travel through the internet to somewhere else. Or maybe you can have uh, some devices. No? You want to switch the lights on or off or get the temperature. So one possibility if you are building your application here your work, say, OK, at this point, I need uh, to switch the lights on. So I need to communicate to some software, some gateway, some something that is able to control the light. This can be done in many ways. It depends on what kind of protocol is supported by these devices. So you create a user interface. The application, the web application, that doesn't interact with the database in the classical way, but interacts with some other software that is the driver of the real hardware, actually. In many cases, uh, these protocols are maybe proprietary, maybe specific, maybe domain specific. 
maybe low-level protocol, maybe serial lines, or maybe, or maybe just a call to an operating system function. It depends. It depends on the device, how to integrate it. In some cases, even the protocol for integrating the devices will be HTTP. Uh, an example that you will see in the lab that just arrived uh, last week are the, the hue lights, uh, the Philips lights that change the color. The lamps uh, run on the ZigBee protocol. So you, you can talk to the lamp directly if you are able to speak ZigBee. So all the radio waves. But uh, the lamps have a controller that speaks, uh, which is a separate um, object, okay, a manager, that speaks to the lamps uh, through ZigBee, but which offers an HTTP interface. So you can send HTTP commands to this gateway, lamp gateway controller, and it, so your application can send commands in HTTP to a small web server embedded into this controller, which is just a disk like this, and it will then translate in some way the command to the specific technology. So, uh, so it will be very easy to test even with a browser uh, the behavior of this web server. So I, all of this actually is integrated in a very small embedded device. Uh, you have both cases. The case in which the application needs to manage a specific protocol, or the case in which this protocol is hidden behind a web front end. And this web will be, of course, a data exchange, not user interfaces. Not, may also have a user interface, but what we are interested in is the API, is the programming interface for the device. And this API is mostly running on top of HTTP. Okay, so this motivates. So this uh, is more or less our general picture. We have an application that can have a web front end or can also be controlled in the, maybe doesn't interact explicitly with the user. So it doesn't need a front end. This application can use uh, data in a, stored in some database, can interact directly to the environment, or can interact with other web servers that on turn can interact with the environment or with some data or with some external services. So it's very extensible. This HTTP technology is very extensible, very simple to add the new functionality to access uh, remote services and so on hmm? without setting up very complex infrastructures. Hmm? Okay, this motivates why we need to spend some more time in understanding better the two let's say, uh, technologies that we need uh, to be able to reliably, reliably manage these connections here. The first is, of course, HTTP. Everything here since the first slides talks about HTTP. So we, need, we, we, had, we had an idea, but we'll go into more detail into how, how it's defined. And the second is, okay, once I have HTTP, I need some conventions, some rules of what type of uh, URL of addresses I ask in this case, because it's not a web page, it's asking switch the light on. How can I write switch the light on in a URL? How can the application tell me whether the light was switched on or off or wh whether uh, w there was an error. So there is a standard which is built on top of HTTP, which is called REST, that uh, tells us how to manage remote uh, resources using HTTP, hmm? the REST server. About HTTP, uh, what we want to, I will skip the general part that we already know, Let's go into a bit more detail about the protocol itself. Uh, so what we saw is that uh, HTTP exchanges messages. Request, response. Every message uh, is built of three parts. The initial line, the first line, a set of headers and a body. The, the initial line is just one line. The headers and the body are separated by an empty line. 
a blank line. Hmm? So one line, one, zero or more headers, one empty line, and possibly a body. Body is not, uh, maybe in some cases we have a body, in some cases we don't have a body of the message. Each of these messages may be a request message or a response message. Of course, in the two cases, this, the content and the meaning of the different three parts, initial line, headers, and body, are different. So we already saw some, some examples. The initial line, in this case, is head slash index, or maybe get slash index. In the response, the initial line is this one. Sorry, this is wrong because it shouldn't uh, should be all be in the same line. So it shouldn't go okay. Hmm? Because the initial line contains the protocol. Uh, why does it contain the protocol? Is done for uh, what is called protocol negotiation. The browser tests the server. This is the highest version of the protocol I am able to, I'm able to speak, 1.1. The server replies, this is the highest version of the protocol I can speak. After this, they are aligned on which version to speak. So if the browser, uh, actually there is no update on the HTTP protocol since uh, 10 years, so everybody, everything is running on 1.1 today. Then in this case, we have just one header and nobody. In this case, we have just, one, just the header and no body because the head request doesn't uh, only want the headers, doesn't want the body, the response will, give, will be given back. Uh, HTTP is stateless. So after I did the, this request and after the server response, immediately the server will forget about me, will forget about my request. If I make another request one millisecond later, the server will not recognize, by design, by the design of the HTTP protocol, the server will not recognize that I am the same user making another request one millisecond after the first. Every HTTP request is completely separated from the others, which creates their own problems uh, when you log in to a website uh, and you want uh, your clicks uh, to be processed uh, knowing that you are you. You have been authenticated with your name. HTTP doesn't store any authentication information, doesn't recognize any session information. It's all done at the application level with cookies. But it's all a complexity that we, we don't want to, to handle. The REST protocol will uh, also use this stateless uh, um, approach. Sorry. I hate animation. Okay, uh, request. So request and response, three parts. Initial headers body. In the request, uh, um, the initial line is always done of three fields. The first is a verb, a method name. The second is uh, the path of the request, local to the server, not the complete URL, but only the final part. And the third is the uh, protocol version, maybe 1.0 or 1.1. Uh, what is the method? Well, this is the, it is the full list of uh, um, standardized HTTP methods. We have uh, the most used is get, means just give me this resource. Post is used to send some data. When you are focusing or sending a post to Facebook, you click on the submit button, it will send not a get but a post command to the server. Say, okay, get this data. The data itself is in the body of the request. So it's one of the, the post is one of the cases in which the, even the request message has a body. In the, in the get, you, you don't have the body of the request, you have only have the headers because there's nobody there to, to send. Put uh, is used to upload a file or to update a previous file. Delete is used to, it may be used to delete a file on the server, but usually if you try this command on a, general, on a generic server, they don't work, of course. Huh? Only, uh, you cannot just write server, 
the fact that the protocol is supported doesn't mean that the server will obey you know, the command that you give. And the other are, are less used, are more, mainly for, for debugging, for uh, uh, understanding the capability of the servers, and so on. Or to opening an HTTPS connection. But these uh, get, post, put, and delete uh, are the most important ones. Uh, the request. About the response, well, the response even at three parts, initial line, the initial line is very simple. Protocol version, status code. The status code is repeated twice. The first time in a numeric way, as a number of three digits, and the second time as a string. The string is easier to read, but of course uh, the browser will always use the numeric version because <laughs> it's easier. And uh, the first, so in the first line you have the status of your request. And the status can be just information, success, or error, or some kind of error, or the tree is a retry, some sort of retry the request. This is the full, no, it's not full, the most important uh, uh, codes that you can get. The code you always hope to get is a 200 code, okay. It means that the request you just did, a get, a post, a put, or whatever, was executed. Okay, done. If it was a get, then the body of the response will have the file that you requested. Uh, in other cases, uh, 201 created. When you do a put to upload the file, it will tell me, okay, I created the file that you requested. Or you can have errors. You see that 500 errors are the server's fault. The servers say, okay, I'm something wrong with me. For example, a programming error, you made an exception, you know, throws an exception, and so the, the application throws an exception, and the, and the web server doesn't know how to reply to the browser because the application just crashed. And so it gives you an internal server error. Okay, my programmer is so lazy, he can't even get the exceptions right. Or 400 errors are the browser's fault. The request was not good. The request has a syntax error, 400, or, or the request doesn't have the right authorization, uh, or the request is for a, the page exists, uh, but it's forbidden, we will not give it to you, or something like that. So the request cannot be executed for different reasons. So 400 are client errors, so you, you, should, you should look for the sort of the error on the client size. Five error, 500 are server errors. Um, and then, of course, you have all the headers, lines. Uh, we will not study all of them, but we just have a look at the most important ones before wrapping up this class. Uh, the headers in the request and in the response. Then in the request, mainly the, requ the, the, um, the client uh, can tell the server what it wants to accept, what languages they can understand, what file formats they can accept, uh, accept, and so on. And if uh, there is some authorization in place, uh, what is the authorization key, basically? Um, one very important is this one, if modified things. When I navigate a website, I probably have already an older version of the same web pages, or images especially. Maybe the, the content of the page changes, but some images, buttons, navigation elements are the same. But the browser doesn't know whether that specific image has changed or not. So what the browser does is a get, is a conditional get. I, if I want get this image, get the logo, logo.jpg, only if modified since, uh, since the last time I saw it. Maybe I downloaded it two days ago, so if modified since uh, uh, March 25, at uh, seven, uh, the seven hour, 37, 35 minutes and 22 seconds. So I, the browser says, I already have a copy of this with this date. You gave me this, in this date. If you have a newer version, give it to me. If you don't have any newer version, don't give me anything because I already have it. And it saves a lot of bandwidth. It's called caching. 
the cache of the browser manages this mechanism. Uh, for the um, For the, the most important, uh, well, the, 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 the response headers, what is it? Okay, it's not, it's not listed here because it was so important that it has. Um, the most important in the request and the, in the response is also the content type that specifies the format of the document being exchanged. For example, if this document is a text file, it's an HTML file, it's an image, or something like that, so that the browser can, or the client can act uh, accordingly. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think we should stop here and uh, start next time from this analysis and then go back to go forward to the rest uh, implementation. Mm -hmm. So we stop here and then we, we have a, some small break before the, the rest.